when the scripture says to be made whole, a lot of times you think, oh, if you're infirmed, if you have an injury. Well, you know, <clears throat> it does refer to that, but even the scripture we're going to read today, uh, it, it's pointing to a man who is lame. But his real infirmity is not his lameness. It is his thinking. It's a, his association with people who think like him. And we see this truth. Last month I even did a message on uh, the whole, I whole idea of culture and community. And I'm going to kind of continue that. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing... I, Peter told me I, I need to write a book on it, and I'm not even really sure that if I have, I have everything together that I want to say today, so it's going to be kind of an eclectic thing thrown together, and we're going to look at the, 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 the social aspect of this gentleman uh, in, the, in, in the Bible that is, has been laid down beside a pool that is rumored, and we don't, we, we don't know that anyone ever was actually healed at this. It's those pools called the Pools of Bethesda, where there's five pools that they lay, a colonnade with a, has a tarp over it. And if you're lame, you're laid at this pool. If you're, you're blind, you lay at this pool. So all groups have come together and gathered together. It's really fun uh, going to, if you, if, if you don't attend, a cell. It's wonderful to go to cell and discuss things of the word. And I just want to thank the guys who, uh, and myself, we were dis we discussed this that helped me come to this place uh, in this teaching. So <clears throat> we live in a um, fallen world. You know, the our Adam, the first Adam, gave this world over to the enemy. And he was kicked out of paradise. It was supposed to be a paradise. And we pray now, says, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. So, you know, we have to face physical things. Uh, everything is running down. We're getting older. We're going to, you're going to die one day if the Lord doesn't return. So your body is running down. It's getting older if you haven't noticed. If you just haven't done, let me tell you, it's coming. So, what's difficult is I know people who are going through a battle of infirmity. Because that's where we're at. We're in a fallen world. We're in, 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 in an environment that can poison you. We, we eat foods that really taste good, but we're not too sure they're good for you. I mean, if you, if you didn't know anything about sugar or... You would think Twinkies were manna. I just, who here doesn't like a Twinkie? Go ahead. Wow. That's amazing. You know, I'm not a real chocolate person, but when it comes to Twinkies and banana pudding, it's just, oh my goodness. So, I know people who are infirmed and they're going through a trial right now. And you know what? They're more whole. Biblically, they're more whole spiritually, they're more, more whole personally than some people who have use of all their arms and limbs. So I don't want you, you know, th that if you're going through one of those battles right now, I'm, I'm not referring to you because I believe that, that most of you that are suffering that are whole in the Lord. It's just a difficult, hard time that we're pushing through. And it says we're all going to see those hard times. God's word is pointing to something that I believe can make the difference of living your entire life waiting on God to do something and not seeing it and having it change today. That's exciting to me. So, if you'll help me move along. So, so at the pools of Bethesda, it's the word Bethesda really means mercy. So they're the pools of mercy. And it's a rumored thing. The Bible doesn't say this is what happened. It was a rumored thing that uh, once a year or every so often, that these different pools, all the, you know, the lame are here, the blind are here, the, the sick are over here, maybe the lepers are over here, but they all gathered together. And it was, the, the rumor goes that if 
the water gets troubled, the first one in gets healed. There's no record that that happened, but everybody's there. Now, it is also an earthquake area. You know, so they don't know actually if it was an earthquake, you know, a little tremble and the water would tremble and, you know, someone would try to get in. But it's the situation and the words that Jesus used that just has stirred me. Just, just stirred me. So it, there's got to be more to it. And I believe we're going to see that today. So that's what's happening at, at this pool. And it says there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people sitting around these different pools to get there. Let's take a look at John chapter 5, verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish, Jewish festivals. It's believed that it was the Feast of Tabernacles. When there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which his aromatic name is called Bethesda, which means mercy, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, five pools and porch areas. It says, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, it, it, and this is really my observation, and I've observed it this week numerous times. Every week, and I've been doing this for a long time, it's, it's just my observation that people who have some infirmity or some thinking in their mind that infirms them from receiving have a tendency, in somewhere in their life, they gather with people like them or people that enable them to think this. You know, I know you, they, they, they ha might have different friends and stuff like that, but there's somebody, it could be a parent, it could be a, a, a neighbor, it could be their spouse, but it enables them to remain in the wrong thinking that is keeping them infirmed emotionally, keeping them infirmed spiritually. It's, it's, there's just a hole in their life. That they gather together to reinforce this thinking. Someone to say, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Oh, no, no, I feel sorry for you too. This is really hurt. It, it, keeping them emotionally bound. So when you hang out with people that, <clears throat> that are limited as you, that is called a culture. They share something. They enable you to think a certain way. They agree with you and what your belief system in. That in itself is a culture. You know, there's a prison culture. There's all kinds of cultures that we live in. And some of us come from a family that reinforces a certain culture. You remember, if, if ever you've moved away from home, especially if you were the youngest child, I was the youngest child by eight years, and you're the, you're the baby. You move away. You're an, you're an adult. You have all these kids. You, you're having a job. You own a business. And then all of a sudden, you're 30 years old and you go back home. How are you treated? Like a baby. And you know what? Too many of us fall back into that. We allow our parents, who only see you as a child, and you fall back into a child fall back into that thinking. That's a culture that you've gone back to, and it grabs you. It is so powerful. There are some who come from an infirmed culture. It's amazing how many people say, oh, well, my mom was always sick, and now I'm this age, and I'm sick. Really? Or is that your culture? I know people in wheelchairs. I know people who are blind. And they go to work every day. That they, they are they are solid individuals. They have hope in their mouth. And you're kind of thinking, you have hope? Man. Because they are whole inside. And we're gonna see that this man that Jesus finds on the edge of the pool. 
He's lame, but guess what? He's not whole. If he were whole, I wonder if he'd be on the edge of that pool. He is gathered together with people like him. Well, uh, Rick Strombeck has introduced me uh, to a a group of men and and women in Orlando. They're successful uh, men and women that are doing great things. Um, And in that club, there's an outstanding, uh, well, it's called Dream Builders. It's, It's men who you know, have dreams, and they're building dreams, and they're helping other people, and it should shake you, says, you know what, build your dream, and they're very successful people, and not all of them are wealthy, they're just, they're successful, they're changing areas of town, they're changing areas of of, of living conditions, and one of those uh, men, uh, Peter, was introduced to by Rick, and he was just over the top with it, and so I looked it up online, and he is a devout believer, and I can see he is changing Orlando. And it doesn't sound religious, but all the principles on his website are going, that's the scripture, that's the scripture, that's the scripture. And he's applying it. Uh, uh, here it is. His name is Eddie Morton. is the executive director of Lift Orlando. Now, what they've done is, <clears throat> he, is he has studied and understands about uh, cultural poverty. That when there's huge concentrations of poverty in one area, there's no helping them. There's no getting them out. What he has done is he's gone down to Paramore and through support. He's got support from Florida Hospital and just all these different people who have been pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars in projects like this already in the Paramore area and nothing helped. He's gone down there and he's building condos really nice condos big you know big ones here and a little one here a big one here and what he's done is he's been selling these condos to wealthy people and the people who live in the area to afford the smaller ones but they're really really nice and what what he he's discovered is that these three things is concentrated poverty that's when you have all the people who are concentrated they have their own culture and there's no flesh the fresh thoughts going into them there's there's no hope there's no one walking around that they can say he made it he looks just like me um judge perry i I just uh, attended a funeral uh last year and he spoke there he comes from the paramore area i didn't know that and he's one of the guys, you know, he did the Casey, Casey Anthony judge. He bought one of these condos and has moved back because he loves the area he grew up in. And now he's, he, he is in that culture, but he is a life flow. People say, you came from this neighborhood? He goes, yeah, I live right there too. Do you know what that says to somebody? I can do it. And they're going to find that he speaks a different language, a different temperament than everyone else. Yet he sounds just like them. But there's something different. So there's a culture that Eddie is breaking up. A a, a fresh flow of opportunity. He goes on generational poverty. This is just what my family knows. That's who we are. Man, I, I just want to come down and just knock you on the head. For those people saying, well, that's just how our family is. That's generational poverty. You know, <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, the McCubbins married a Lynch, and they're all about 5'8", or, or Joey's 5'5". Five, five and they're going, well, we're all just short people. Not anymore. They just adopted Owen. <laughs> that boy's going to be 6'8". Uh, so. <clears throat> Toxic charity is another one that this man lists. He goes, there have been there, there are so many charities for the last 30, 40 years that have poured thousands of dollars giving money, buy, making parks, doing this, doing that. And he says, it's just made the place worse. 
And his answer is, he goes, we don't go down there and give them anything. We go down there and we partner with them. We help them start a business right there. We help them. We don't give them the apartment. They buy the apartment. We show them how to buy the apartment. In Philadelphia, when we lived there, there was these two high rises. When you come in off the Schuylkill River, and these high rises must have been 20. I mean, there's, and they were twins. In five years, they were condemned. They were built high rises to put in the poor people, people of poverty. In five years, they were condemned because they found out that when you concentrate poverty, it becomes a slum. And this, this gentleman is attacking this from biblical principles. Biblical principles. He's changing. He's changing the face of the, just a slum area in Orlando. And it's working. Well, Jesus is going to show us these principles at this guy by the pool of Bethesda. <laughs> it, it, you, just, you just see this attitude. The problem is culture always wins. What is your culture? Look at your culture. Because your culture is the one who's giving you excuses to live by. That I like First Corinthians. First Corinthians says, don't, "Don't be fooled. Don't be misled. Don't don't fool yourself. Your bad company is going to corrupt your good character." So it's just saying what what you know Eddie said. What I've said says, you know what your culture, the culture you're 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 in is going to destroy the character that God is trying to lead you to be. There are girlfriends you have to say goodbye to. There are best friends you have to say. I, 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 I had two really good friends that I tried to hold on to. One of them was the best man in my, my wedding, and I tried to hold on to him and tried to hold on to him. They, he's a lawyer. The other one was a policeman, an OPD. These are good people. And my wife just says, why do you keep hanging around these losers? They're not going to change. They're changing you. And I, I had to go to him and said, you know, you're my best friend. You were the best man at my wedding. I can't afford you. I can't afford you. Every girlfriend I had, except for Crystal, <laughs> I, think, I think I can remember one. <laughs> That's every one, if it's just one. I couldn't afford them. Not because they, they wanted jewelry and, you know. I couldn't afford them emotionally. They made me someone else. Bad company. It's going to change your character. Prejudices, bad habits, poor reasoning, blame shifting. It's our culture that allows us and says it's okay to make that excuse. It's okay to make that excuse. That's your culture telling you. It's not, it's not the, the word of God. And the problem is, in most cases, it leaves us paralyzed, unable to be whole. Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13. Walk with the wise and become wise. Wow, because companions of fools suffer harm. That's my story. Anyone else with me? That's my story. I like those people. I can't afford them. It's cost me in my marriage. It cost me financially. These guys would borrow my car. Do you think my car came back the way it went out? No. Borrow my boat. One came back and said, hey, I couldn't get your boat here. I go, why? It's upside down, Lake Kissimmee. Okay. Let's go get it. Mm. You know what it is? 
It comes down to this. Birds of a feather flock together. Do you know what? This is good and bad. Successful people like to be with people who need to make excuses for the way they live and the choices they make. Get with people who make excuses for bad choices. They blame shift. It's someone else's fault. These five porches, these five pools have a concentrated group of people with the same limitations. They didn't even mix it up. Okay, uh, all the paralyzed over here, all the blind over here. You don't want to feel less. Like, I don't know, put, put me over here, I'm more comfortable. Put you with all the people who are just like you and are making all the same excuses. I'm more comfortable. Now, I, I want you to know that we, in, in our cell system, we have small groups all over the city. We, you want to gather with people like you, but here's the difference. The people who are gathering in that home are wanting to find God's purpose, are wanting to have, when, when they need prayer, that there's people there who believe in prayer and believe in wholeness. So you are gathering, you're, you're birds of a feather, you are flocking with people who are desiring the same things. There's a difference between desiring for the better and, uh, you know, and, and God and making excuses and trying to call it God. Because, you know, there's some churches that you know, we take in the sick and they'll, they'll cry and they'll weep and they'll just pamper you. But that's not this church. We'll cry and we'll weep and we're saying, okay, now believe God. Now come over here and let's do this. Let's weed this out of your life. Let's get that thing out of your life because it is creating a culture for you to remain sick and limp and weak and blind. It's going to get, oh, you're with me. <laughs> Whenever you go, uh, let, me, let me get, let's go to the girlfriend thing, okay? Any single people in here? Okay, all right. You know, I, girls, how many of you are looking for the guy who completes you? They complete me. Who wants a half a girl? I don't want someone to complete you. Here's somebody who will complete the circle. Do we have a complete circle? No. Not if it does that. <laughs> they have the same strengths you have and the same weaknesses. They're emotionally, they can't handle emotional things. You're no more complete. Now you got this thing hanging on your back. Sometimes, oh, they complete me this much. Who wants to be completed that much? Who wants to be completed this much? This is not being complete. This is two halves. And two halves, two, two years of your marriage end up being like this. You want a whole. Yeah. This is how you should look when you get married, ladies. Let me get the blue side out here. This is what you your husband should look like. Because you know the Bible says two are stronger than one. Because you remember what I said, this life has fallen and things happen. You can lose your job. You can get sick for a period of time. You, you can, um, someone leaves you, there's a death in the family. And guess what? And so here you are and something really has happened and a piece of you gets blown away. Who's behind you? If they're a half a person, it may hit the same insecurity of the half person that you married. Married people, get whole. Get whole. Find your security in the Lord. Find, if, if, if you think your husband and your wife, oh, they bring this strength to me, what happens if they're not there tomorrow? Who, who's with you now? They're gone. 
They were in a car accident. Did, I, I really like this. They're like, uh, let's go back to the house. They, they, they complete me. God's completing you. Who's your security in? Who's your trust in? Come on. I married a whole person. Do you know, Crystal, can, if, if I don't show up tomorrow morning, Crystal's going to be sad, but Crystal's going to be okay. <laughs> I wish it worked that way, but <laughs> but you know what? That's the other part that keeps me on my toes because you don't need me. <laughs> she wants me. And that's hard to believe, I know. <laughs> you know what? We become codependent out of choice. You know, it, sometimes she's stronger doing this, I let her do that thing. Like anything she puts her mind to. Uh, <laughs> no. And I do things better over here, but you know, through 41 years of marriage, we switch. You know, we switch jobs sometimes. And she goes, I'm tired of doing that. You do it from now on. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, but we're whole people. And if you're not whole, to make your marriage stronger, don't look to the other person and say, we got to go to marriage counseling, which is not a bad idea. But you know what? Before that happens, you better become a whole person in the Lord. You, know, you got to become a whole person. Because, guys, in life, these chunks get blown out of you. A band of two is stronger than one because life is tough. And then that piece comes back. And then maybe a chunk gets blown out of her. And you're solid. Well, hallelujah. Let's... Wow. I, I mean, it's just, you know, when people come into my office and they go, our marriage stinks, I'm going, no, you're a half a person, I don't know how I'm going to fix your marriage. You're an emotional mess and they're an emotional mess. Who's going to be the strong person? Who's going to be the person who has to give more? People sh show up and their car is completely out of gas and they're looking at the, their, their partner and say, help me up the hill. And he goes, I've been out of gas for a month. Very difficult. So here we have is one person, Jesus comes up and it says that he finds out that this guy has been here for 38 years. Jesus isn't even 38 years old. And he's come to change the world. And he is changing the world. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition. It doesn't say that he's been lame. It says he's been in this condition. I believe that Jesus saw the whole condition. He said he's been in this condition for 38 years, and it's like he can't believe it. For 38 years, he comes and sits on this mat. 38 years, you would think, you know what? I could get a little closer. I could maybe grease up the mat so I could slip in and beat everybody else in. You know, I could maybe prop myself up on a pole and as soon as I see it tremble, you know, <laughs> fall in. 38 years he's been in this condition. And he's, he says to him, do you want to get well? Guys, if you've been doing something for 38 years and it ain't working, I'm thinking you really don't want to get well because there are things that you can do. There's other things you can at least try. 
I talk to people and, and they go, well, we're not making enough money. And I said, you know, what do you do? And he goes, oh, I do such and such. I go, how long have you been doing it? 30 years. So what are you doing now that's different from when you started this 30 years ago? Nothing. <laughs> and you're telling me you really want to make more money? And you're doing the same thing. So for 38 years, you've known that you're not making enough money, and yet you're doing everything the same way. That's called insanity. What's wrong with this man? It's not that he's lame. He's in a culture of people who are making excuses. Making excuses why I'm not healed. You know, he could be out begging and making money. I know they do it at my exit on I-4. <laughs> I was amazed. I saw a guy begging. Uh, and the next day I went to the 7-Eleven. He's in there buying a pack of cigarettes. He's going, what's the cheapest cigarettes you can buy? Four bucks a pack. It's a wrong culture he's in. You can buy those things. That's fine. But it doesn't make sense. That's a wrong choice if you don't have much money. But he runs around with a group of people that says it's okay. You're entitled. Sir, <laughs> the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. It's someone else's fault. It's someone else's fault. <laughs> she said, do you, want, do you want to be healed? Honestly, come on, 38 years of doing the same thing and living on the same excuses. So the hundreds of people all around them, do you think they have the same excuse? Absolutely. Here's the problem when you're with people that, that have nothing to give. Well, it says cultivating wholeness in your life is a deliberate choice. You make regardless of your age or intelligence. Proverbs tells us that there is there's no one that's giving information, no guidance, no guidance for the people who fall all the time. 1114 Proverbs says, but in abundance of counselors, there's victory. Now you're thinking, well, I've got, let me tell you, you want counselors? Look around this room. Go to a small group where you can be more intimate. And you just see how this person's marriage works. Watch how they talk to each other. That's a counselor. You see someone's children who, I mean, I don't like my kids like that. You don't have to ask them going, teach me. No, just, just watch them. See how they instruct them their children. That's a counselor. This whole idea, can I get a meeting with you? I need some counsel. Just watch people who are making it, who make the right decisions, one after the other, after the other, after the other. That's a great counselor. But the person who thinks that they have it all together has no counselors. In your own mind going, you know, I got the answer. I've got it. And it should be this way. Well, it's... Miracles that you need in your life start in the flesh. Like, that's a horrible thing to say. They start in the flesh. Worship today, I don't know who got into the spirit. You go, man, it was the presence of God. It wasn't at that first chord. You know, Jared's back there and comes out and goes, come on, guys, we got to go. They came, this uh, they came last night and they practiced. They came last night in the flesh. 
They made a decision. We're going to go, and in hopes, we're going to make it to the Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, starting around verse 42, it says everything starts in the flesh and goes to the Spirit. The first Adam came in the flesh. The second came in the Spirit. You make a decision, it's in the flesh. People going, well, I've been praying for healing. Yes, you prayed in the flesh, but you didn't pray through to the Spirit. You started in the flesh and you finished in the flesh. I've been praying for this. Yeah, Lord, help me. Thank you very much. Okay, we're done. Yeah, you start in the flesh, you end in the flesh. How about starting in the flesh and move until you end in the spirit? That you know that something was released in you. That God actually heard the, a cry in your heart. It's different. Well, you know, you know when you're in a group. We, you, when you're in a group that that is looking for excuses for their being a not whole. Those people, you think it's you're comfortable with them. They're not your completion. They're your competition. <laughs> they want exactly what you want, but only one's going to get it. And so you're competing with them. Instead of having a big guy says, you know, there's an answer for every one of us in here. Well, you feel so safe in that group, you're competing. They're not completing you. So I have something for <clears throat> the small groups. I'll just mention it, but this is a discussion that you have. And, and once again, this is an observation. It said that cultivating wholeness is a deliberate choices regard I mean it needs to be done now don't think I'm going to be old enough or I got to make more money no that's not wholeness here's where it starts you need to know that one person one place one thing are not going to make you whole you're people thinking if I just had a house if I just had a husband if I just had a wife if I just had this that's not going to make you whole it is going to be deliberate choices as a lifestyle that make you you whole. Stop looking for one person, and I know I'm talking to a room full of people that said, if we just moved to North Carolina, if I could just get this job, if I can get this, if this would fix our marriage, if we just did this, and it's never one thing. That is a fool's pipe dream. One person isn't going to fix you, including your husband, including your wife. I remember Crystal and I we were newly married. The girl, our two oldest, were just little. And she, she's going, something's wrong. Fix it. Fix it. Something's wrong. I've, you work all the time. You're gone. You're associate pastor at this church on the weekends. I never see you. I'm stuck with these kids and blah, blah, blah. And I go, I can fix this. And I went downtown, Philly, put her on a train to Virginia Beach so she can spend the week with her sister. <laughs> I couldn't fix her. But I know another woman could. Someone she trusts could. It, 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 it's not one person. She was looking for me to fix it, and I couldn't. I could be a part of it. You know what part of it was? I bought the ticket. I drove her down there. I picked her up. I called her during the week. I was one of the many people that had to help. Balance self-interest and the common good. That's the difference about being around a group, you know, that all wants to be healed. You know, on a plane, they always say <clears throat> there's a difference because God sees your heart. He knows if you're just wanting to fix it for you. But I know I, when Pastor Peter was here, you know, he said, look, he goes, why, you know, God wants to bless us, but for what reason? So I can get a bigger house or I can bless other things and people and support a culture and a church and, and give it to those who are in need. He knows your heart. It, it, on a plane where they say, uh, if there's any, if the oxygen things drop down, they say, put your oxygen mask on first. For this reason. 
so you can help other people. Even the world knows this. You know, your oxygen mask dropped down, and you see your little child there, you see the old lady up there, you don't run up there and hook, you're going to pass out before you get there. Both of you are going to die. It says, get well. God knows your heart that you're going to help the person right next to you. As you, soon as you put that on, and you put it on the next person, and put it on the next person. God knows your heart. And he's saying that you're hoping for why? So you can just keep it to yourself, or you're going to help others. And, and this, these are my observations with biblical understanding. That these are things that you see in whole people. Those who are not whole don't walk in this. They may think they do, but they don't. Three, aim to understand rather than judge. I tell you, people who are in need and not whole, they are the most judgmental. People who are whole, you don't, I'm whole. So your beliefs and your thoughts and your words don't have that effect that it does when it's said to you because you're not whole. Does that make sense? The problem is this is, this is good and bad because when you go to a church and you have a, a church that's whole and there's people who come who are needy, you know, we have the tendency, and it's going to go into the next point, we have more mercy, we have more patience, we have more understanding, and sometimes we make the mistake and we keep people there instead of delivering them the truth like Jesus did. So, wait a minute, do you want to get hit well? Or do you just want me to support you for the next 38 years? Jesus said, wait, you want to get well? It's amazing. He says, stand up, pick up your mat. Yeah. He didn't reach over and touch him. He didn't pick him up. He's, he made a demand of that man in his flesh to try to get up. And I'm telling you, I guarantee you the rest of the room. People are going, why didn't he... Why didn't he heal everyone in that room? Because I bet you in everyone in that room that he would have gone up to him and said, stand up. They're going, I can't. I can't. He did. In the flesh. And it ended in the spirit. Aim to understand rather than judge. Focus on purpose over pleasure. Why, whatever challenges in front of you, here's, I, I, I have to be purposed. My life has to be purposed. Even my fun has to be purposed. You know, why am I going to go on vacation? Because I got to just kick back, relax. I, why am I going to go invest in that? Because it's got to have purpose instead of just, it's going to make me feel good. People, it is proven that we are purposed as believers. The day that we were born, that even before we were formed in our mother's womb, God knew us and he had a purpose for us and his kingdom. That is health. That is wholeness. You can be infirmed. You can have an illness that you're dealing with right now. You can be slow. You can be short. You can be tall. You can be overweight. You can be divorced. And I'm telling you, you can be whole. You can be whole. 